so I'm Sarah Poitras, uh, and I'm really happy to be here at my second LAM Action meeting. Thank you so much to Leanne and Jill and everyone on the committee for inviting me to speak. Um, so I have LAM, and I also love to travel, and I'm trying to actually make a business out of it, so. <laughs> Uh, because seeing the world has helped me cope with having LAM. So that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about today, and I'll be offering a bunch of practical tips for how to make travel easier with LAM. And I put the presentation together with the help of some other women with LAM, because even though I ha do have a lot of experience, um, I know people have had so many different experiences, um, so it's based on all of that. Huh. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a quick intro, so I'm 39, recently turned, um, and this year my husband Justin, who's back there in the pink shirt, uh, and I will be celebrating our 10 year anniversary. Uh, we got married just about six months before I was diagnosed. I was born and raised in New York, but we're currently living in the Netherlands. That's just a little bit more about me. Um, and over the past three years or so, um, Myself and my husband have become really passionate about accessible travel, so helping people with disabilities or chronic illnesses see the world, um, people in wheelchairs, to people like us who just have breathing issues. Um, so I have a blog called Travel, Breathe, Repeat, and we have a business called Accessible Itineraries that helps people plan itineraries and deal with some of the logistics that um, come along with planning accessible travel. So just to tell you my brief LAM stats, um, I was diagnosed in 2010. I have sporadic LAM. Uh, my biggest symptom is shortness of breath. That's how I was diagnosed. I also have chest pain sometimes and, and fatigue. You know, one day I'll be totally fine, and the next day I take a 10 minute walk and it'll be dead for the rest of the day. Um, I've been on Rapimune for almost nine years. I was put on it a few months after diagnosis. Um, I also take Depo-Provera and an inhaler, which Simon was lucky or nice enough to look at for me and tell me what it actually was <laughs> after his talk <laughs> earlier today. Um, and I use oxygen for exercise and for when I fly because I desaturate, you know, at those times. And this picture was taken in Yorkshire last year right before the other LAM action meeting. So, and that's me with my POC. So, Basically, um, just a little more background about why travel is so important to me. Um, three months after I was diagnosed, Justin and I had a trip to Spain planned, and we were really nervous about it. You know, we love to travel beforehand, but this was going to be totally new. Um, I didn't know what might happen. I had to use a portable oxygen concentrator for the first time on an airplane. Um, but we talked ourselves into it, and we went, and we had an amazing time. And it was really the first time we enjoyed ourselves in months. Um, so after that, we started traveling much, much more. Um, every two to three months, every vacation day, we could get our hands on. We would just hit the road. And then in 2016, um, we decided to quit our jobs to travel full time. So we were on the move for 13 months, visited 27 countries all, all around the world. Um, and we met women with LAM and heads of foundations and doctors around the world as well including uh, Jill in the UK. Um, and then in 2018, we decided to move to the Netherlands from New York so that we could keep traveling more easily and also to start our business to help um, people with disabilities travel as well. So this is just a uh, little collage of us in our standard selfie pose uh, <laughs> in various places around the world. Um, and so really, I think for me, and the reason that I love to travel so much is how it's helped me cope with this. Um, I really think that travel has been therapeutic for me and can be therapeutic for other people with chronic illnesses or disabilities um, for a few reasons. So at a base level, it just helped me think about something else. When I was first diagnosed, I, all I thought about was LAM. I was terrified. I was scared. I was very upset, and, and I couldn't get it out of my head. It also helped me think about other things other than myself um, because, you know, I think I just became a little bit insular <laughs> and self-absorbed, if you will. Um, and it taught me to appreciate, you know, the beauty of the world, big and small, new food, new animals, um, riding a train in another country. Um, it really just expanded my worldview 
And when I was diagnosed with LAM, my worldview became very, very small and was really in need of, of that expansion. Um, travel also helped me tra challenge myself. Um, you know, being away from home, being in a foreign country, trying to learn a new language, having to climb stairs to get up to a subway, having to climb a hill to see a beautiful view, just all the different things that I have to do to challenge myself. Um, it's not always easy traveling I, with or without a lung disease, um, but I welcome those challenges because I know they've made me smarter, more confident, and more open-minded. Um, traveling helps me be healthier. I think going to the conversation earlier about exercise, you know, I definitely have made it more of a priority in my life so that I can do the things that I want to do and I'm not sitting behind a desk eight hours a day anymore. Um, you know, we're not traveling full time anymore, but even in the past three years, our trips really just were the catalyst for me getting out there, being more active, and, and just being healthier overall. Um, and travel has also connected me to a lot of women and a lot of other people in the LAM community. Um, we went to Japan and, and talked at a meeting there. Um, we, we, when we, when we took our trip for the year, you know, we made raising awareness and connecting with people a huge part of that trip. Um, and it, and it's been one of the things that I've loved most. And, um, specifically one of the reasons I'm here today is because I met Jill in Edinburgh in 2016. So I don't think there will be any questions, but if you have any questions now, <laughs> feel free to ask them. Um, I'm going to get more into the specific tips and recommendations about how to actually travel. So, okay. So this one's a bit more detailed. Um, so tips for traveling with Lamb, just in general. And again, um, you know, I put all of the rest of this together with um, help from other women with Lamb who I've connected with on Facebook and in, in other ways. Extensive re research and planning. So first, wherever you're thinking to go, research where you're going to make sure the climate and environment, you understand that and how it might impact you. If you're used to some a dry climate and it's going to be more humid, if you are going somewhere high altitude, all that stuff can impact how you feel. And you, know, you should just look into that when you're deciding where to go. You want to look around into how to get around where you're going. Um, public transportation is how we usually travel, but we also like really walkable cities, um, really flat cities, one of the reasons we moved to the Netherlands. <laughs> um, also, see how close your accommodations are to main attractions, you know, how you'll get around, how you navigate those. And when you're looking into accommodations, you know, I always look to see if they have stairs, if there are hills that are nearby. Sometimes it's not really obvious, like on the hotel website. So I read hundreds of reviews, and you know, you might find it like two pages in. Um, but I've been surprised and having, you know, ha had to walk up really big hills, and it just kind of changes your trip. Um, and then when you're looking into again about a destination, you know, look at the main attractions you might want to go to. Are they going to require a lot of exertion? Um, what kinds of things do you want to do and what kinds of things are there, and that might help you make your decisions. Um, involve your LAM specialist in your trip planning. Um, my LAM doctor in New York was the first person we told that we wanted to go travel the world before any of our friends or family or anyone else um, because we wanted to make sure she didn't think we were totally crazy. Um, and she helped us think about all the different issues that we may not have thought about in terms of destinations and where we were going and vaccinations and anything else. Um, and vaccinations. Make sure you look into vaccinations. <laughs> um, you might have to visit a travel doctor to do that. Um, you know, and it may not impact you, but for, there were a couple places we wanted to go that required a live vaccine. And since I have a reduced um, immune system, I couldn't do that. Um, build an extra time in your itinerary for rest days and naps. So I used to be super on the go, planning everything to the hour. And now I am a lot more laid back, but I also, we, we travel a lot slower. And you know, it allows us to get it to know a place better, but it also just allows me to rest. As I mentioned before, there are some days when I just can't get out of bed. So you need to build that in to any vacation you want to take just, just so you're not disappointed. Um, and take care of yourself. So you know, there, there are certain things you can do. Um, that you just want to make sure you do when you're on the road too. Stock up on medication. 
Uh, you might need to bring extra in case there are any delays. Uh, arrange any supplemental oxygen early. I'll talk a lot more about oxygen in a minute. Pack light. Uh, I am a recovering overpacker. <laughs> And I do still have lapses. Um, but now every time I think about putting that extra pair of shoes in my suitcase, I think of my poor husband who ends up carrying both of our suitcases up all the stairs. And, and I, I try not to do it anymore. Um, translate words that you might need to use into the local language of where you're going. So lung disease, risk of lung collapse, oxygen. I have a little. Um, card in my oxygen that I bag that it has the name of it in the language so when I get to airport security and they ask me what it is I can just easily pull it out. It just is like helpful. Um, and leverage the global glam, uh, global glam community. Um, if it'll make you more comfortable and you feel like you need to research local hospitals or LAM clinics, um, that's always helpful. We definitely did that when we were going further afield, especially more remote places. And you can always ask others for advice. So I see lots of conversations happening on Facebook. I'm not around here, so did I do that right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so when I did talk to other women with LAM about their experience traveling, the trickiest thing that came up are everything that could possibly go wrong or related to oxygen. Um, so again, I have my own experience um, flying with a portable oxygen concentrator, but I also reached out to other women about their experiences traveling with oxygen to help put together some tips and recommendations. Because we don't want, if you need to use oxygen, um, you know, we just want to, I want to help you feel prepared and confident and that it isn't a barrier to going anywhere. General tips. Um, so, again, as I mentioned before, consider if your destination is at a place where you might need more oxygen than you're used to or if you might just need it, period. Um, so I don't use oxygen 24-7, but when we went to Zermatt in Switzerland, I kind of knew I would need to use it because I do desaturate at high altitude. That's why I use it on the plane. Um, so we did bring the oxygen and we're prepared to use it. I actually desaturated much more than I thought I would. Um, so I should have brought a, the larger battery, you know, but now I know. Um, so even now, you know, it's just nice to kind of consider where you're going because it, it might happen. Give yourself extra time just overall. Um, the physical act of rushing, but additionally the stress associated with rushing can increase breathlessness and then you'll get more stressed and then you'll get more breathless and then it's just a vicious cycle. Um, and ask people for help. Um, people are willing to help even in other countries where they may seem you know, intimidating. People are always nice and friendly in, in my experience and you just need to be comfortable asking for help you know, no matter where it is. So um, I have never arranged delivery of oxygen at a destination, so I did reach out to some other um, women to get this information. Um, you know, their advice is pretty consistent with what I've experienced with flying with a portable oxygen concentrator. Um, make your arrangements as early as you can. Uh, triple check all your arrangements. People said sometimes they only double checked, but then they decided to triple check when things still went a little awry. Um, take all the necessary contact information you need. If it's not cost prohibitive, and you know, again, I don't know if it could be, um, you might want to ask that the oxygen gets delivered to your destination a couple days before you're actually getting there so that you can call ahead to make sure it actually got there. Um, remember to let the destination know to expect a delivery, not just the oxygen provider because they might get something and if they're not, um, expecting it, they might turn it away. And bring your own supplies and extra supplies, um, something that you might want to use that you're used to or extra connector pieces or something like that. Um, so this is really where my expertise lies based on um, my experience flying with a portable oxygen concentrator. So in terms of steps, uh, research the airline's policy on flying with oxygen. Um, before booking your flight because if you book your flight and then you can't bring the oxygen, that would be bad. 
Um, and if you can't find the policy, usually it's on their special assistance page, but sometimes it's a little hard to find. So you could try Googling the name of the airline plus oxygen. We do that a lot um, to see if then it'll come up on a page that isn't you know, otherwise obvious. Uh, make sure the POC works that you have. <laughs> Um, and if you rent one, you know, if you get it a couple days early, make sure it works. I've had that happen to me before where it didn't work. Um, you need to take enough batteries that last 150% of the flight time, so make sure you have those. We um, were planning a very long trip and we actually had to get an extra battery because we didn't have enough. That is an airline requirement, but also good practice. Talk to your doctor or to staff to arrange the necessary paperwork you'll need. Usually you need to fill out a medical form or have a letter that says you're fit to fly. Um, I do this as early as I can, but sometimes there's timing requirements per airline, and I have a template um, for a fit to fly letter that I use just to make it easier for my doctor. Uh, get organized the day before the flight. So charge your batteries. Turn the machine on again just to make sure. Make sure you have all your forms. Pack extra cannulas or any cannulas at all because once I actually forgot the cannulas and my poor husband had to go back from the airport to home, back to the airport again to get them. Um, you can always request other special assistance from the airline. So I know some women have said they, they use a, ask for a wheelchair just to conserve their battery or their oxygen. Uh, supply, even though they don't usually use a wheelchair, so you can talk to the airline about what they offer. In terms of um, tips for the day you're actually flying, uh, get there early. Um, if you are able to give your machine a little charge when you get to the airport, you know, try to you can try to do that. Um, some flights or some planes have power, but you're not really allowed to use that or able or it doesn't always work. Um, just know that if you are a special assistance case, then you have access to priority boarding if you want to take the time to get yourself situated on the plane before everyone gets on. Um, allow more time for connections for the same reasons you would get to the airport very early. You don't want to just have to be rushing you know, through the airport to, meet, to make a flight. Um, keep everything you'll need for your oxygen or just the flight in general down under the seat so you don't have to worry about going up into the overhead and lifting your arms and taking stuff out. Um, it just gets tiring and you can desaturate more. Um, and those are just um, some of the general like steps and tips about flying with oxygen. And again, the whole goal and of this is, is really to just feel independent and prepared and confident when you travel, when you fly with this extra thing that we need to do. So as I mentioned, just a brief plug for the blog, <laughs> this is the, the page that um, basically we talked about all of the steps and then it has links and funny anecdotes about all of my experiences flying on different airlines um, based on you know, specific things that happened if it's not perfectly clear on the website itself. And we honestly refer back to this ourselves when we need to look something up. Um, so I just wanted to end with a quote and a nod to uh, Dina, who I've never met, but she is another woman with LAM who I've talked to many times. She has very high oxygen needs, higher than myself. She uses it 24-7 um, at a high flow, continuous, but she doesn't let it stop her from traveling. Um, and so, you know, she was an inspiration to me, reading her stories and everything she has to go through. It, it's a lot more than I do, but she still does it and loves it and is really happy that she can. So that is all. Another question? Thank you, Sarah. That was really helpful. And oh. I definitely resonate with the being late and rushing. <laughs> My husband makes a habit of being late for everything and has no idea how much stress <laughs> it causes and therefore how much breathlessness it brings on. So <laughs> that was really useful. Um, does anyone have any questions for Sarah? Thanks, that was really interesting and very inspiring. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I've got a question. Do you have um, the sense that you could get oxygen anywhere in the world? I mean, I'm a, I've been using oxygen for a long time, and um, I think there's, there's a few things. And one is unexpected things. So one time um, I was at a boarding gate ready to get on a flight, and at that point my oxygen concentrator failed. Mm. So. Um, one question is, 
whether airlines are required to give you backup in case that the portable concentrator fails? What happens in those situations? I don't know that they are required to have backup, but I, so I, I would actually like to look into that. That's an interesting question. Um, I know at the, at the airport there's nothing they would be able to do, for example, you know, if the POC died at the gate. Um, but I think if you suffered a medical situation on the plane, the, the airline is required to help you, you know, however they can, just like any other person on a plane. Yeah. And, and the other thing I wanted to say is um, to point out British Airways in particular as an airline who have, as far as I know, the most kind of progressive oxygen policy, which is that they will supply you uh, with oxygen so you can hook into their mains, as it were, free of charge. Huh. Um, and there is no other airline I've come across that offers that. And they won't do that for short haul flights, which they count as anything under two hours. But anything over two hours, they will give you. Um, so you hook into their emergency supply, but it's oh, wow. kind of in the top. Um, and it goes up to, you can get two liters of four liters huh. and for, for the duration of the flight. So I was really impressed with that. And do you just request it in advance? Or? Yeah, so they have a medical clearance. The other thing that's good is that you're not turning up with paperwork on the day and going like, here's a letter from my consultant. They have a medical clearance form mm -hmm. that you need to um, send to them at least, I think, two or three days before the flight. Yeah. And usually, then they give you clearance. Yeah. And once you've got that, it's on your documents. Most of the yeah. most of the airlines that we've flown, it, it does have to be done in advance within a very specific yeah. time frame. Yeah, so with EasyJet, they just said, oh, just bring a letter from your doc doctor, which is all, I mean, there's so many kinds yeah, of letters, yeah. and they don't say what information they need. Um, but then the, other, the only thing to point out about British Airways is, is they think even though their air stewards do have some training, it's pretty limited. So, you know, once you're kind of up, they say, oh, we'll come to you once the airplane's cruising. And you go, like, well, that's a bit late for me. Yeah. So they'll give you sort of a little emergency one. But then the kind of plugging into the mains bit is um, because those plugs aren't used very much. They're very stiff. Mm. So somebody with some experience needs to. And sometimes it takes them up to 20 minutes to kind of hook you up. And it, it's obviously a bit stressful because you're already in altitude. And, right. you know, um, so what I usually do is I take the concentrator for sort of getting to the airplane. Then I fly exclusively with British Airways because be, just because of this oxygen policy, and then. Um, but I think one thing that's very off-putting about traveling with oxygen is that if there is some sort of cock up, you're nobody is going to take responsibility. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I always think, oh, I'm, I'm going to book. I don't know to go somewhere lovely and exotic. What if you turn up and the oxygen's just not there? And it's not happened to me in the past. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'd be quite cautious. Um, or I'd like to hear from you how reliable you found that service if you went, say, outside North America, Europe, and yeah. the UK. Yeah, so personally, um, I only fly with the portable oxygen concentrator, and I, and I have my own um, after renting one for a while and having issues with rental deliveries and all, and all of that. Um, and I do know that it is on me if something goes wrong. So similar to your experience, I... Um, recently blew out the adapter to the portable oxygen concentrator when I was in the middle of a, a trip and had to try to figure out how to get a, a new battery or a new adapter sent somewhere. Um, you know, so being in Europe, <laughs> it's uh, a little easier. There's a lot more information and, and available. Um, going to other places, I would be a little more hesitant, but I would just recommend doing more and more research in advance. Um, I know there are places that deliver oxygen everywhere around the world. There are people all around the world who need oxygen. So it's just a matter of doing um, that research in advance. As far as I've worked out, it's about 100 pounds a day. Yeah, it's very, very company. expensive. So, yeah, so it's, um, you know, going outside the UK simply means that you have to add that much for every day of your Holiday. Yeah, I mean it is an expense. You know, every time I've talked to someone looking into oxygen, getting it delivered, it it does cost. It does add an expense. Um, you know, my expense came once when I bought the POC myself because I didn't get. I had to do that in the United States. I had to buy my own. Um, so, but yeah, but I, yeah, unfortunately. It is not covered, it is expensive, and there just needs to be a lot of personal research that um, you need to do. We've, we found that you can, well, currently, 
subject to a certain thing that is going through Parliament or they're fighting about at the moment. Um, you can at the moment get oxygen free in the in Europe through the 111. <laughs> It is not simple. Mm. I wrote about it in the Lamp Post a couple of years ago when I went to my niece's wedding in Germany. And it took a heck of a long time, a lot of phone calls, because nobody, nobody knew anything about it. Mm -hmm. You ring the Department of Health, they don't know. They give you another number, you ring them, they don't know. You talk to your oxygen companies, they haven't got a clue. Um, and eventually, we worked out how to do it. And I could go to Europe again, provided we're still in Europe. Uh, <laughs> because I've now got a contact, and I can yeah. phone them. But when we went, because the oxygen companies here won't let you take their portable oxygen concentrators out of the country, I have one. It's an old sequel, and it's, it's just about died now. Mm -hmm. But when I took that to Germany, it didn't like... It's been to Jersey and to Belfast, but going to Germany, you go above 30,000 feet, is it? Whatever. You, you, go, you go higher anyway. Oh, okay. And when it got to the cruising altitude, it started alarming, hmm. which obviously started alarming the people around me because there's this thing going beep, 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 beep. So I turned it off. Yeah, um, I, <laughs> I was only going to Berlin. So it's not a very long flight. Huh. I know if I'm sitting still and keeping calm, I'm OK. And then as soon as he said, we're now beginning our descent, I could switch it back on again. Hmm. Then it worked. But So it was the physical machine being yeah, higher? Yeah, it didn't, it didn't like the lack of air. Hmm. So... But, but I tried to hire a portable concentrator, and it practically doubled the cost of my holiday. Yeah, it, yeah. And it, it just was unaffordable. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, our, my portable oxygen concentrator was very expensive, but given all, given what we were setting out to do, I, I needed one. Um, you know, and the amount that we traveled, the hassles with dealing with the rentals, and so hopefully it <laughs> keeps lasting. I've had it for about four years now, so fingers crossed. <laughs> yep. Um, I've got to get a card, which I got from the lab action, so mm -hmm. I'm rather touchy now. Um, it, it, it explains the land center in, in, and what land is, and it says if your doctor is unfamiliar with land, and then explains what it is. Wouldn't it be a great idea to have this in different languages? Yeah. For traveling? It would. So that, you know, when you were, you know, if you have a, a crisis of some kind, you can hand it to someone. So it actually says, you know, that, uh, at the end, symptoms consistent um, neurothorax or renal bleeding should be investigated urgently. Yes. So they understand that you're not, you haven't just got a bit of a, you know, Yeah. When we um, when we first started traveling more, we did we hand wrote something like that, um, so that we would know how to say that in different languages. Now it's a little more advanced. We can kind of just pop it into Google Translate when uh, we're in a place. But yes, it, it was it made us more confident and comfortable that we would be taken care of um, if something ever happened. But yeah, that's a that's a great idea. Um, we just had one last question, which has come through via Facebook. Um, we do kind of have the answer to these, this question on previous editions of Lamp Post, but just very briefly, someone's asked if um, there's ever any problems getting travel insurance with Lamp. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so I don't know, and in the UK, I know um, there's different travel insurance. Um, for myself, when I think that... It's more of a pre-existing condition thing. That's what they say in the United States. So anyone with a pre-existing condition, you have to just look into specific policies and you have to buy the policy. The biggest issue is you have to buy the policy within a very short period of time after making your initial deposit on the um, trip. That was what I ran into. When we were traveling for a, a much longer period of time, we had to look into 
policies that both covered long-term travel as well as pre-existing conditions. Um, we were able to find them, but it's not just. It, it's it's not it's as not assumed. As it shouldn't just be assumed. Person. Yeah. yeah. But it, yeah, if, yeah, if anyone wants to um, pose the question on one of our social media sites, then we can get lots of um, advice to you. Yeah, it, it does keep changing all the time. We've got, we've got lots of past editions of LAM Post, and we've also got information on the LAM Action website about it, but it does change all the time. So, um, yeah, if anyone has a specific question, just ask away. Yeah, we can get it, and it's affordable. So, yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to ask, which countries have you been to? Oh, <laughs> how many? 56 uh, in total. Um, a lot. So I'll go to continents, but <laughs> well, no, that's like three. But um, I guess the furthest flung place we went was New Zealand um, and went to some amazing places on the recommendations of Jill and actually met Jill in Australia. <laughs> so we also went to Australia. Um, we spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia, so Thailand and Vietnam, um, Laos, Cambodia. Um, and then we've kind of covered most of Europe at this point. Um, there are a couple of those really tiny, itty bitty little countries we want to get to. <laughs> um, we have been to Eastern Europe. Thank you, Jill, for the reminder. So we just recently got back from uh, a, one, a, another trip to Poland. We do enjoy Poland quite a bit. Um, Czech Republic. We haven't been to Russia, so that's on the list. We haven't been to China. I'm a little nervous about the air quality there, but the food just is so good. Um, <laughs> We haven't done much in South America, so that's an enormous content <laughs> continent. Uh, and I really want to get to Easter Island because of where Seralimus was discovered. So that's like the bucket list right now. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.